We're going to finish this uh, uh, course content uh, with the conversation about uh, uh, winning and the scoreboard and, and our attitude toward that. As I've mentioned from the beginning and I've alluded to throughout, this is the real flashpoint for uh, this philosophy. It certainly is a flashpoint of how people, uh, in addition, a uh, flashpoint of how people treat the score, uh, referees and the opponents. Um, but this, the issue of winning and losing and the issue of the scoreboard uh, is uh, by far the larger significant flashpoint, even as they both are. I want to uh, uh, just make one mention. I, I said previously, just for me, and I wanted to explain the what and the why about why I say develop rather than training, why I say impact rather than influence. Here's another thing I used to talk about. The goal is to glorify God by excellence, is the way I said it, not winning. And now I've changed that. I don't use the word excellence anymore. I use rather perfection. And I talk about aiming perfection. I want to explain why. Uh, not that it's wrong. It's just my conviction. It's not wrong or right. It's just my conviction. And both those, or all, all three of those words or phrases and concepts what I found with excellence is excellence is just way too gray meaning it's subjective what's excellent to you and what's excellent to me are two different things you can believe something's absolutely excellent and somebody else may feel like that's mediocre at best and so when the word excellence out there it's in a sense overused to mean something that's so innocuous and can be so muddled and muddied that it doesn't even give a clear distinction anymore. That's what I found, because the word excellence has been used a lot, both inside and outside the support word. What I found ever, however, is that the word perfection, there's no gray in it. Perfection is perfection. It's, it's 10 out of 10. Frankly, in, in, in baseball, you're an excellent hitter if you hit 3 out of 10. But perfection is 10 out of 10. So you can see an example there in sport, where a guy has an excellent free throw percentage, if he's hitting 80%, he's, he's excellent. If he hits 90%, he's in the handful in the history of the sport of basketball at the professional level, or frankly, probably at any level. But perfection is 10 out of 10. And the scriptures use the word perfection. God says, be perfect as I'm perfect. We understand that has to do with heart and attitude and not behavior. It's an aiming for perfection. It actually uses in the NIV, aim for perfection. And so philosophically regarding this uh, competing biblically uh, philosophy of sport, uh, philosophy of competition, um, we use aim for perfection now rather than excellence. So if you run across old documents that you find either on the internet or somewhere where it's talking about this philosophy, it may not have been cleaned up is what I'm trying to say. The documents may not have been cleaned up. I might even accidentally use the word excellence sometime. I don't want to. I want to use the word aim for perfection. Again, that's a high expectation. There is no higher expectation than perfection. However, when you marry it, doctrine of both, with grace, high grace, then high expectation and high grace, then perfection and high grace is not problematic. I want to have high expectations for myself as a husband, as a father, as a friend, as a worker, as an athlete, as a coach, as a fan. I want to have, I want to be held accountable to high expectations in my walk with God and my walk with people. At every level, I want to be held accountable to it. I don't want people uh, 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 criticizing me necessarily and being dogmatic and dominating, but I want them to be what I'd consider to be biblically, to hold me biblically accountable, which is to attempt to build me up I'm giving them the right to ask questions. I'm giving them the right to say, you said this or you did this. Are you sure you want to? That seems to be inconsistent with your profession. I want to be held accountable to the Word of God. Not to people's opinions about the Word of God or opinions about life. I want to be held accountable to the Word of God by people who care deeply about me and want me to become who I want to become. This is the kind of accountability that we're trying to reproduce and multiply within the sport world, let alone within the, within the uh, uh, Christian world also. There's the same principle that we apply in the school of discipleship or in, forget the schools, in life as a Jesus follower. We're looking for people that care enough about us to tell us the truth as the scriptures say. We're looking for people who judge us by the word of God, not by their opinion or by their opinion about the word of God, but what does the Bible actually say? What are the commandments? What are the principles what are, the, what are the guidelines, what are the boundaries of the Scripture for our provision and protection, not people's opinion, if that makes sense. And so I say that to say 
our terminology is aimed for perfection. You may or may not agree, and that's fine because there's room to disagree on that. Uh, we, we always advise that we not be disagreeable in our being in disagreement. This is part of being kind and considerate in all things, even in uh, situations where you have strong, strong convictions. We have a strong conviction about the terminology, and the terminology that we use is to aim for perfection. So, that's a preface in talking about this, which we're going to discuss over the point of these next uh, different uh, clips and, and course content. The goal is to glorify God. This is the target. Fundamentally, this is the target. We say two by four, and we mean that, according to the Word of God, by the power of God, for the glory of God. And the glory of God is that we live for the praise of His glory. That's actually a Bible verse. We live for the praise of His glory. We live to lift His name high, that God will draw all men to himself. This is our target, and sport is our vehicle. Not winning, that's the point. Not winning, not outcomes. It's process versus results. Let me hit on some phrases or sentences that will help us uh, uh, expand on this articulation. Winning is, uh, uh, is not the primary goal. It's not even the secondary goal. Glorifying God is the primary goal, the second goal, the only goal. The byproduct of it is a lot of things. Outcomes are a byproduct or a result of people coming together who play competently at a high level, meshed with whatever their talent mix is. It's it's, it's about people closing the gap between their potential and their performance. This is to us what winning is. Winning isn't the scoreboard. The prize is not a trophy. The prize is being with Jesus forever in eternity. That's, we're running, we're running a, a race in such a way to win that prize. Now, are we also attempting to succeed on the scoreboard or win games? Yes, but not as a primary or secondary goal. In, in Frosty's philosophy, which I grew up in, which is why I feel so strongly about it, he never even talked about winning. He never said even when we were in playoffs that we have to win this game. He just said, let's play as long as we can. He found terminology that diffused the issue of winning and losing in the scoreboard because he knew that the outcome of that philosophy is it demotivates. At some, at the end of the day, it demotivates. And I've described that when I talk about goal setting. It demotivates because in certain scenarios, which happen all the time, it actually causes you to close the gap less. It, it, it increases the gap between your performance and your potential because certain goals inhibit performance. And, and the best way to reach the target is to actually not run toward that goal, which is fascinating. Even if you don't care about Jesus, even sports psychologists, some of them, would say that if you focus on the results rather than the process, you compromise the process, which then compromises the results. I always said it when kids talked about wanting to play pro football. I said, it's nice for you to have that, that goal. Uh, it's nice for you to have that dream. Now, we talk about this. This is from Frosty. I like this little phrase. He says, see, dreams are something you can see but can't touch. Goals are something you can touch today. And so he talked about goal setting, things that you can touch today that put you on the track towards your dream, whatever it is. It's a nice articulation. And I think it helps people think about it because the word goals can mean kind of all kinds of stuff. What's the difference between a dream and a goal? Frosty came up with an articulation. I've embraced it. I just shared it with you. You don't need to. It's not, it's not critical as a distinction in the midst of this conversation about the school of sports ministry. I'm just thrown out there to say I had a dream as a young kid to play professional sports. But if I don't work today to get better, the chances decrease that's going to happen. I could work with a whole heart, clear mind, strong will, and great passion every day, and it still couldn't happen because there's a link to talent there and a bunch of circumstances I can't control that either inhibit or allow for that target. But for sure, if I don't take care of business today in terms of my body, my mind, my emotion, my will, my spirit, then the chances decrease that I'm going to reach that goal today or that dream tomorrow. Does that make sense? And so you're bringing people back to what can I do today? The terminology nowadays is the next play, the next shot, right? It's about, we use that example in the golf deal. What's the most important shot in a golf round? It's the next one. It's not the last one. It's the next one. Because if you don't take care of the next one, you decrease the chances it's going to be a good outcome at the end. 
And so every moment of every day and every play, if you're, according to pop psychology right now, and according to the Word of God, is that you want to take care of the process. I want to block and tackle. I need to get good at the fundamentals. If I want to be a godly man, and if that's my dream, then I got to have goals that are in line with that dream, which means I better read regularly. We say daily. I better have a prayer plan to pray different kinds of prayers. We use tacos as an acronym. And to pray sometimes short, but sometimes play long. You better have a Bible memory plan. You better have a gospel presentation plan, a gospel invitation plan, a share your testimony plan, an accountability plan, a plan to how to learn to feed yourself. We call that by learning how to use a study Bible to study the Bible. If you don't have a plan to daily take care of those goals, then the chance you hit the target decreases. Doesn't mean you won't hit it. It just decreases or increases based on what you do today. If I want to lose weight and I keep waiting to change my diet and my habits and my exercise, then I can have that dream for a thousand years. I can promise you the chances are slim to miraculous that that's going to happen. But what I do today can feed into what I do tomorrow. And the, the fascinating thing is you got to do it every day. And if you don't do it every day, then it just slows down the process because you can't skip steps. You don't become strong overnight. There's no magic pill. Frosty always talked about that, and it's a great metaphor. There is no magic pill. There is magic, but it's not a pill. There's no fast way to get great. There's no fast way to be super mature. It's a daily progression of steps or goals that you reach that it puts you on a track with that end result. He said this, you want a magic pill? Here's magic. He said, make a greater individual commitment to what you want to be perfect at. There's no magic pill, but there is magic. And the magic isn't some external force. It's you internally making a decision to make a greater individual commitment to Bible reading, Bible memory, Bible study, gospel presentation, being a spouse, being a father or mother, being a friend, being a worker. If you want to aim for perfection or be, let's use bland words, excellent or great at anything, you have to make a greater individual commitment now and then next and then again repeat the process. This is, this is the thinking that we have that drives us as, again, another piece or another pillar or another spoke or another link in the chain about how we think about these things. And so, once again, winning is not a goal at all. It's off the table. It's a complete result or byproduct of a whole bunch of other factors, some of which we control and some of which we don't. What we can do is with our attitude and our effort, our heart, our mind, our will, we can intentionally, that means on purpose, we can strategically, that means with a plan, glorify God by giving our whole heart, a clear mind, a strong will, and great passion to apply ourselves at any given moment of the process, whether it's internal or external. This is what we're, this is the what and the why. The how is what it looks like when we get in the heat of battle or in preparation for a heat of battle in sports. That's our off the field or off the court or off the mat preparation. That's what happens internally in our mind, in our emotions, our will, and our spirit as we get it ready. That's what happens then when we go to the practice field, whether it's off-season or in-season, whether it's in a small group or individual time, whether it's private or whether it's as a group or whether it's an official practice, whether it's a big practice, a small practice, whether it's a game. All of this is worship. All of this is acknowledgement of God, His Word, His power, His glory, this is our practical expression of this philosophy. 